Good morning, everybody, and welcome back at the second day of the RNI Days. We are here with you today with a session on the new European Bauhaus Collaboration, Community and Culture for Innovation. We have four magnificent speakers lined up, but of course we also want to interact with you because people are really at the heart of the green transition. So I would like to invite you all, take your coffee, go to slido.com, use the hashtag RIDays22-2, scan the QR code and please use Slido to talk, to put in your questions for our speakers. And I would be very, very happy to then take your questions uh, towards the end of this session. So the context of the session is really, of course, our big challenge of all times. We in the European Union have had the European Green Deal, which is really our motor and compass to guide us through these challenges and to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. But of course, people will be at the heart of our transition. And this is where the new European Bauhaus comes in. Because the U new European Bauhaus will not only make sure that the transition will be sustainable, but also that it will be beautiful and inclusive. Now to warm up, I would like to, for you to basically go to the Slido and look at the question at Slido that we have for you this morning, because I would really be very interested ahead of this session, how would you describe the new European Bauhaus in one word? So please, start typing in your one word how you would describe new European Bauhaus, and maybe by the end of the session, you would change this word into something completely different once you have heard the interventions from our speakers. So when you are typing, um, I would like to already introduce our first speaker, who is Alicia Herboska. Alicia, welcome. And uh, I think yesterday evening you did not yet know that you would be joining us uh, this morning in the session. So this is really for you uh, also a big surprise. Thank you for jumping in. Unfortunately, Commissioner Gabriel has uh, unfortunate and ex unexpected other commitments. So it's really great to have you with us, uh, Alicia, this morning. Uh, and uh, it would be great if you could give us a three minute introduction from the Commission side, why European Bauhaus is so important for our green transition. So Alicia, three minutes, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, as you said already, the commissioner uh, could not come today, unfortunately, but she asked me to, um, to um, warmly welcome you and to say a few words um, in her name. So uh, first of all, um, I'm very, very happy, of course, uh, that we are having this, uh, this session at the RNI days about the new European Bauhaus and very happy to see uh, other distinguished speakers uh, here, especially uh, our rapporteur from the European Parliament, Honorable uh, Mr. Ross and other um, distinguished panelists like our very good uh, collaborator from the EIT. Um, so, um, when we're talking about the new European uh, Bauhaus and, and innovation, um, um, when we think about what innovation is, uh, we can say that it is an unrelenting drive to break the status quo and develop a new where few have dared to go. This is a quote from, from a business innovator. Uh, and the new European Bauhaus is exactly innovation in action. Um, the initiative encourages transformative and regenerative approaches um, and combines the values of aesthetics, sustainability uh, and inclusiveness. Uh, and this is to improve the quality of life for all. Uh, this is very important, this, this quality of life aspect in the European Bauhaus. Um, and I would like to today maybe highlight three characteristics of how the new European Bauhaus supports new types of transformation through innovation. Um, and of course, the, firstly, the new European Bauhaus uh, builds upon the power of citizens and communities and supports them to become key actors of the green transition. Uh, they are the vibrating heart of, 
of the new European Bauhaus. Um, the, the initiative started with a human center, place-based and bottom-up approach. Uh, and our growing community is now composed of more than 500 entities. Uh, these represent universities, multi-level public authorities, non-profit organizations, businesses, um, and they come from more than 20 different sectors. Um, so we, through the NEB Lab, for example, try to support this, these innovative projects that emerge from our community um, the, best, the best we can. Um, and uh, of course, um, we have a speaker today also from the EIT community. So this ecosystem has also been growing and um, was mobilized through the EIT community, New European Bauhaus. Uh, and they are implementing a range of activities um, from New European Bauhaus hackathons to citizen engagement calls, um, all of this um, to support innovative entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, maybe as a second thing to highlight is the, import, the, the importance of art and culture, uh, who are also very powerful drivers for innovation and transformation um, and key components of the New European Bauhaus. Um, so building on local culture, um, tangible and intangible, cultural heritage, traditions, know-how, craft, um, contemporary diversity and creativity um, is the key to the social transformation that we are seeking. Um, the New European Bauhaus supports the intersection of old and new to spur innovative ways of doing and thinking. Um, arts and cultural heritage are among the topics that the six uh, new European Bauhaus Lighthouse demonstrators uh, announced uh, in the summer uh, will deal with. So the third characteristic that I would like to highlight here uh, is also um, fostering a multi-level approach to transformation, to develop local solutions in neighborhoods, villages, cities, and these local solutions um, we are hoping will address global challenges. Um, and the initiative is supporting local authorities to experiment with new approaches to co-design um, and to place-based solutions. During today's session, we will learn, actually, this is very exciting, which cities have been selected by the craft platform to test innovative approaches to make their climate neutral transformations beautiful, inclusive and sustainable. Um, so th these three features, these three expert, um, aspects that I've been talking about um, are the very proof to me of the entrenchment of the new European Bauhaus in research and innovation. Uh, and so maybe I will, I will stop here. Um, and again, thank you for all for being here today for this interesting discussion. And uh, I will um, give the, the floor back to you, Rosalind. Thank you very much, Alicia. That was very clear. Now, going back to the word cloud, I see that the colleagues online, the first word to describe New European Bauhaus is confusing. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, you know, the three key elements of New European Bauhaus in your opening speech have shed a bit more light on what European Bauhaus is. I took away from your intervention that it's really about innovation in action to improve the quality of life, that we place the citizens in the center, uh, that we also want to use the impact of arts and cultures to drive forward the transitions, and that we take this multi-level approach where we are really working with different levels of governance, different levels of stakeholders, and and also in different sectors to really drive forward these innovative solutions. And I hope that by the end of the session, especially the colleagues who find it still a bit confusing what it means, know a bit more. So now it's my big pleasure to introduce the first speaker on our panel. The first speaker of our, on our panel is Mrs. Annemie Wijkmans. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Annemie is from the Norwegian University of Technology and Science. Uh, and Annemie is really the driving force behind the CRAFT project. And the CRAFT project is a project that we are funding under uh, Horizon Europe, which is, of course, as you all know, a very important program to drive forward the innovations in the European Union. Um, and Anami will tell us in a second all about this craft project and how it is really helping both our transitions and incorporating the new European Bauhaus principles. Uh, 
And me also, and this you probably don't know, studied political sciences and then swapped it for architecture. Um, and Anami now, of course, by working uh, together with the European Commission in this craft project, is back a bit also into the policy making. So really great that you can combine uh, your talents uh, and again also help us with developing and rolling out the new European Bauhaus policy. So Anami, the floor is yours. Please tell us a bit more about the craft project, what it is uh, and how it will really help our society. Thank you, Rosalinde. Um, the craft urban movement uh, started four months ago in May and craft is short for creating actionable futures. And of course, it's not just me. It's um, a lot of people that are working with this. And basically, it's about supporting cities to not just become climate neutral, but to do so in a way that makes them even more beautiful, that pulls on heritage and identity, that makes them inclusive and just and sustainable. So in this way, we are a bridge between the city's mission and the Net Zero Cities platform and the new European Bauhaus. So we want people to combine both. And in May, we started off with three sandbox cities that were just ready to go and had actually been working on this for a long time, Prague, Bologna and Amsterdam. And soon we are going to release the names of 60 cities and city clusters that are going to join us on this journey. First, we'd like to show a short video of what these three sandbox cities have already been doing. Building positive futures. All across our continent, people from different backgrounds are helping to transform their cities into sustainable, beautiful and inclusive places. Creating actionable futures, in short, CRAFT, is a European Union funded project bringing together cities and their citizens, policymakers, arts and academia to jointly shape the transition to climate neutrality. CRAFT draws inspiration from the European Cities Mission and the new European Bauhaus principles. CRAFT connects and showcases examples of local collaboration models to be replicated and scaled. Meet some of them in the first three cities. Facing the climate change, the city of Prague adopted its own climate plan in 2021 to promote sustainability in power generation, heating and transportation. Our goal is to facilitate experience-based learning of professionals and citizens regarding challenges and solutions linked to the urban transformation in Prague. Bologna has become a forge of ideas and projects tested and implemented in the city through different initiatives. The city as a commons approach is already part of the city's fabric. In order to promote the culture of collaboration, the municipal policy has supported the organization of participatory processes. We are here at the marine terrain. Architects, designers and scientists have in common that they are experts in transformation and searching for new possibilities. This power of imagination we now need to determine the direction. What I think makes the AMS Startup Booster unique is the fact that we give uh, startups access to knowledge and information coming from our industry experts, from our researchers and from our strong ties with the municipality. By engaging the community, citizens and students to think along with us, how do we want to innovate in the city? The craft urban movement is growing. More and more European cities are joining. Want to learn more or look for ways how your city can join? Please visit our website. It is your future too. Will you help build it? So, yes, um, as said, we started with three cities and we are adding 60 cities to this right now. Uh, I think we can show the map to everyone. So before summer, we released this call for cities to join us and we were overwhelmed by the responses of a lot of cities across Europe, um, small, larger cities, everyone very committed to making this journey with us. And um, we are, so we are really proud that so many cities have decided to join us and we really look forward to building this future with them together. We're going to have a first kickoff in Prague um, hosted by Prague with all of these cities, with also the NEB Lighthouse projects that were mentioned in the beginning, and of course other people from the NEB and the city's mission communities. So we look forward to this. 
Thank you so much, Anami. This was really uh, very, very inspiring. You also mentioned the city's mission, uh, which uh, is uh, basically a mission for the European Union to have at least 100 climate neutral cities by 2030. We have selected these 100 cities. You can find them uh, in in all the member states, we have at least one city that has committed to this. And it's really great to hear um, that this project will really help the cities not only to become sustainable and climate neutral, but also to make sure that in this transition, we make sure it is inclusive and also beautiful. So now I would like to go to my next uh, panelist and introduce her. So it's my big pleasure to have with us Natalie Vera. Uh, Natalie Vera is working in the EIT community of the new European Bauhaus and you will tell us more about this uh, in a minute. Uh, but Natalie, uh, I also learned um, that you're actually the first one in your family who took a different career path. I heard that you are basically a family of everybody studied medicine and it's really great uh, that you basically chose a different path, that you are, you're working in the EIT uh, and really bringing forward the new European Bauhaus community. And could you please tell us, uh, Nathalie, how is the EIT uh, community working uh, with the communities and the cities uh, to make sure that we can really transform our local communities into sustainable, inclusive and also beautiful ones? Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me and thanks for the question. Indeed, the EIT community in European Bauhaus is working uh, with uh, community-led uh, activities since uh, last year. So we have a track record since 2021 of supporting uh, last year 16 projects and we are supporting on this year another 18. We have plans to continue until 2025. And what we're doing is issuing uh, two uh, calls annually one on citizen engagement and another one on co-creation of public spaces uh, through co-design by citizen uh, groups and uh, local or regional authorities. So these two types of calls help us to um, identify suitable partners. Usually they are NGOs or educational institutions or civil organizations that work together with end users. And we uh, try to identify what are the most pressing challenges in their local um, uh, grounds and neighborhoods, cities, towns. And we try to co-create and co-design potential solutions to those challenges that do have the European Bauhaus core values, which are um, sustainability, inclusiveness, and aesthetics. And we also, do this through um, uh, multidisciplinary approaches and multi-level approaches. And so, for instance, for the uh, co-creation co um, calls over there, what we ask is for a partnership between um, a local authority or a regional authority together with a um, civil society group. So in that way, we ensure that the solution co-designed is effectively implemented. So basically what we try to do is to interact grassroots together with um, top-down approaches and putting that together, we are able to implement on the ground um, sustainable, uh, beautiful together um, projects. Some, some examples I could bring, for instance, of uh, the citizen engagement one is uh, a project we developed last year in Lugos in Romania and this is a city where there's a tradition on biking and kids normally go uh, with this sustainable transport to, to schools. And uh, the, the, the activity uh, tried to identify the, the challenges, the risks, the dangers in the way of these kids to, to school. So thanks to that identification, now there are regulations being uh, taken. Um, and another um, co-creation uh, project that we're currently developing is the ASD uh, project that uh, is taking place uh, in Spain. And it, it's focused on the uh, autism spectrum disorder. So we're trying to um, implement na nature-based solutions in public gardens and in playgrounds for these uh, specific group to have more sensor sensorial um, elements so uh, they can have for, for not only for the, the kids but also for their families uh, and, and an environment where they will feel uh, comfortable and accepted. 
Um, and I think this, this replies initially to, to the question. Absolutely, Natalie. Thank you so much. And I think it was also extremely helpful, at least for me as a moderator, but maybe also for some people watching us online with these concrete examples. Because, you know, we talk about citizens' engagement, co-creation, but I think the examples you gave really make this, you know, come alive and really that we understand better that we are really here to develop like new innovative solutions together with the local communities that are sustainable but at the same time also inclusive and, and beautiful. Great, so now it's my big pleasure and honor uh, to introduce to all of you our last speaker uh, and this is Mr. Marcos Ros. Marcos, welcome. Uh, Marcos is a member of the European Parliament uh, of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, uh, a member for Spain. Um, but of course, um, Mr. Marcos also uh, has uh, a different um, career and uh, different talent. Uh, and I think you have a lot in common with, uh, with Annemie here uh, because you're also an architect uh, and an expert in the rehabilitation of heritage buildings. So that is really uh, very impressive and, and very good to know because I'm going to ask you a question uh, in particular, you know, on the role uh, of the arts and culture. How can arts and culture best be mobilized uh, uh, from the European, but also to the local level then uh, to drive this innovative and, and societal transformation? So, Marcos, the floor is yours and big welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Rosaline. And this question for me is one of the key points of the new European Bauhaus. We, we need and we must understand the cultural basis and necessary, that are necessary for understanding and adapting to the new lifestyle that we nowadays have and to achieve a complete mobilization of the cultural and creative sectors we need to make the population aware of the need for these changes and the support and culture can give an example for example when we are constructing a building uh, or a space to to have the involvement of the architects we need also engineers and other professions but Many times we need to involve also other disciplines like sociologists, like lawyers, like geographers, like env environmentalists, and going a step further to really incorporate this dimension of beauty in our projects and in our society. We, we th I think that it is imperative to involve the cultural sectors. We need to emphasize that culture is closely linked to architecture. But in a second way, uh, we need uh, to, to incorporate also the education. The education will have, as always, a key role. We, the education is very present in uh, the report that the European Parliament adopted uh, a couple of weeks uh, ago. And we have called for innovative curricula to be developed in line with the principles and the objectives of the new European Bauhaus for cultural edu education and the development of special and creative skills. And we also need to uh, reskill our workers. We need a high quality built environment, but we need the training of skilled cultural professional craftsmen and women and workers is essential. And in the third way, I think we can mobilize uh, with a, uh, uh, we can mobilize culture and arts uh, through the cultural and social access to each uh, to of each place, uh, the knowledge of each place, artisan through culture and heritage together with local association and organization make a place unique. And we these are the elements that make uh, that we call a new urban house called the sense of belonging. It is a fact that cultural and creative sectors have been one of the most affected all during the pandemic and cultural heritage is also facing challenges and the new European Bauhaus must support and promote both priority, prioritizing sectors and places who need, that need it most. Excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, that was very, very clear. Uh, and uh, I also really like the fact that you underlined the fact that, you know, these transitions should also, you know, take into account the, the local cultures uh, and, of course, the important role of education uh, and skills. Great. So let me go back to you, Annemie, um, because, I mean, I now understand a bit better, you know, that this new European Bauhaus is about fostering collaborations between citizens, between creative people, between local communities. What do you see as challenges and opportunities in order to really bring all these communities together? Right. Oh, that's a very big question. Because um, everyone talks about, yes, we need to cooperate, but to do that in practice, 
on a daily basis is really difficult. Um, these are people's daily lives that we're talking about. Uh, it's yes, of course, we need new technologies, we need climate plans, etc. But in in effect, it, it's people's daily lives that that need to change. And also, as a citizen, you know, you, you you hear about oh, we need to reduce and we need to replace and we need to remove, and it's it's often so negative, and you feel that you can't do anything. So, what we want to do is to create a positive future and actionable, so something that citizens really can get engaged in. And we want to build trust and we want to empower people and we want to really make this part of people's identity that yes, we're going to be climate neutral and it's actually going to be much better than it is now. So we need to reach people in a very different way than we've done until now. So we work with arts and culture to, to not, you know, not only the big culture with the big C, but like every day, everyday culture, arts in people's daily lives, um, nature-based solutions, you know, so things people see and feel and encounter every day. Uh, we work with youth and students. We're setting up a big student, like a pan-European student think do tank, where students are the drivers of change. Uh, we're working with property owners, we're working with businesses, entrepreneurs, um, and, and so many more uh, citizens, of course, grassroots organizations to just see what is it we can do every day locally. Yes, we need the big infrastructure plans and the, the expensive changes and the big political decisions, but while we wait for those, how, what can we do in our daily lives together with our local communities to start making a change? And that's also what all of those cities have committed to is that, yes, oh, that's something we can do. We might not be able to become climate neutral by 2030, but that is something we can do, and we're going to start doing that right now, or even then do this together with everyone else. Great, I love it. I think it's indeed so important to really engage with the citizens, because of course we can have all these big ambitions, uh, put them you know, in a policy document, but in the end, the real change will only happen you know, if, if people will in their daily lives adapt uh, themselves a bit and, and make these changes uh, towards more climate neutrality. Now we have been talking a lot uh, about the local communities, the role of the citizens, the role of the creative uh, industries. Uh, but Marcus, I wanted to ask you, because we haven't really touched upon the role of the EU member states. I mean, what can the national governments do? Yes, I think the member states uh, must play a key role the, that many of, the, uh, uh, in fact, they are playing this key role. Many of them have been demonstrating this during the beginning of the, the, the initiative. Uh, one example of this involvement is the creation of the national contact points uh, with the aim of co coordinating all the efforts to implement the initiative at national level. But now I think that the member states have a big opportunity to facilitate a culture-driven transition through uh, their policies. That is the Resilience and Recovery uh, Facilities, uh, Recovery and Resilience Fund. They can apply, they can incorporate measures focus, uh, focused on uh, revealing the cultural industry uh, and put then the funds into the right direction. Um, let me end with uh, an example. One of the best examples comes from my country, Spanish government. Uh, the relevant ministry has been working to the, incorporate the new European Bauhaus principles into its policies. There are several calls for funding in which uh, they say if a project matches or complies with the spirit of the new European Bauhaus, it will be uh, uh, overscored to other projects. So uh, we are, we, we can wait for, for the big funding of the European Union, but we can start now with the funding that each member state has. And I think the member state uh, has to involve and to be very committed and engaged with this initiative, because it's the only way to spread all, uh, all across the, the European Union. Excellent, and also great that you can already see that at least in some countries also this is being picked up by, by the national governments. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, let's go to, to Natalie, uh, because Natalie, you already gave uh, in your first intervention some really great and concrete examples. And of course, I think it's really good if we have kind of like one good example that we can also try to spread it and replicate it uh, elsewhere. Um, could you illustrate uh, an example what you think, you know, it would be really a great new pathway uh, for innovation that we can also replicate uh, at EU level? Yes, sure. 
So there's like there's um, a project we're supporting this year in in Porto, and the project is called Porto Think Tank. So the focus of, of that project is to work on the on the uh, wash houses uh, that were formerly used by women, um, normally less favored uh, um, class uh, women, uh, to wash uh, by hand uh, clothing. Um, now these these places they, they call lavadouros in, in Portuguese. In Portuguese, um, they of course they're not used anymore. So uh, the Porto Think Tank project um, brought the idea of um, rethinking these places uh, to make them of use of the community at present. So it's a beautiful heritage we are thinking about with the lavadouros because we're thinking of. Um, women activities traditionally we're thinking of places that have connections with water so water channels across so uh, nature-based solutions and the environment and um, is around uh, also um, uh, there's there's the opportunity of uh, maintaining the heritage because the the machinery over there is is somehow beautiful so it's it's a way to maintain heritage culture uh, aesthetics and and these these um, and as we are, are uh, consulting with the um, uh, local uh, neighbors of those avadoros, uh, what would be the best use of those places for the current needs of the, of the community? So I think this is a nice example that brings um, inclusiveness. Uh, it brings also sustainability, brings also culture, it brings also architecture and brings also uh, the involvement of of the pertinent authorities because at the end um, if you have a, a great idea at grassroots level but then cannot be implemented then you don't get the the the, the successful result you would be aiming at so um, one of the key elements of, of this uh, project is the involvement of the of the local authority um, and the alignment um, with with the regional um, uh, policies as well um, so in brief, I think uh, this, this uh, Lavadoro uh, project brings the elements of uh, putting citizens at the core of the solution. So we're, what we're doing there really is social innovation, because what we are doing is asking people who live nearby that Lavadoro what they want that infrastructure to become for them. Um, we're having multidisciplinary approaches because we're including different uh, social groups, but also we're involving artists, architects, and pre people from the culture uh, world. And, and we're involving uh, the authorities. Um, and uh, overall, we are cherishing the heritage of the place and, and maintaining uh, the, the specific features of, of, the, of the town. So I think this is uh, a nice example to bring. Thank you so much, Natalia. That's indeed very telling and, and very illustrative. Now, I would like to, to go to Slido because, uh, I mean, in the beginning of this uh, session, there were quite some confused uh, people in the audience. Uh, so let's take a few questions uh, from the audience and see if we can hopefully by the end of this session uh, all be very much understanding, you know, what is this new European Bauhaus movement and why is it so important for this transition? Um, so I see a question from somebody who's a bit shy, uh, anonymous. The named cities are mostly large ones. How can smaller cities up to 50k inhabitants participate at craft or other new European Bauhaus initiatives? Anami. Yes. We said 60 cities um, and we had a lower threshold of 50,000 inhabitants uh, to align with the city's mission. Uh, but we also gave cities the opportunity smaller cities to team up with neighbors or with their region in order to be able to apply and in fact a lot of cities did that so we have 60 cities and cities clusters but they are basically covering 105 cities so a lot of those are smaller than 50,000 um, and they base even cities across country borders joined forces to sign up so we, we hope that this can be a start of looking at how we also can engage in the new European Bauhaus, in the city's mission, how we can engage smaller cities, less than 50,000. So we, we're experimenting <laughs> in uh, NEB tradition to, to see how we can make this happen and we hope that others can learn from it. 
Okay, excellent. So if I understand correctly, the intention really is to spread then these solutions also to other cities and also the smaller ones. Yes, and the whole region, yeah. basically. Okay, excellent. That's really great. Okay, then we also have a question from uh, Doris. Thank you, Doris, for the question. Uh, energy poverty slash cost of living crisis in Europe is threatening to derail commitments to sustainability. Is it possible to have sustainability and inclusion? Very good question, Doris. I think this is really on the minds of many people. Uh, I don't know, Marcus, maybe you would like to this say something. This is uh, exactly the aim of the new European Bauhaus to combine, to try to combine sustainability, inclusion and also beauty. Don't forget, but I think the inclusion is one of the key pillars of these three pillars of the new European Bauhaus. I think, of course, we can we can try to achieve uh, and combine these two uh, these two concepts. Uh, for example, we are now trying to uh, adapt and uh, we are with the revision of the energy performance of building directive, and we have included the the necessity or the need for the member states to make a national restoration plans uh, every year. And in this plan, they have to uh, make an audit to where are the neighborhoods uh, in which we overlap two characteristics buildings uh, with a lack of sustainability but also uh, people who live with low incomes uh, these neighborhoods should be the the fo the, the, the target for uh, investment uh, on the renovation wave so uh, we have to combine these two concepts we have to to be sustainable but we, to 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 invest the funding the public funding in those areas we, in which uh, leave people who need it most and this is the key uh, the public investment has to combine uh, these two aspects. Excellent. I love the way you say it. I remember many years ago, we were really talking about, you know, sustainability and competitiveness, you know, does one exclude the other? And then we said, no, no, this actually are two sides of the same coin. I think we can basically add now also this exclusiveness element to that coin. It will be a bit of a strange coin because, you know, I think this all goes hand in hand. Eh? We have to be sustainable. At the same time, we need to make sure that the sustainability supports the competitiveness of our European industries, that we are inclusive. And of course, also the, the beauty element is very important because I mean we all want to live in climate neutral cities but I mean they need to be beautiful as well and a, an agreeable place to live in for our citizens thank you so let's see another anonymous question uh, we have and this uh, I think is for you Natalia because uh, anonymous uh, uh, colleague would like to know whether you have already some lessons learned from the EIT community on your European Bauhaus uh, in the field of innovation and citizens engagement that you could share with us today Yes, sure. But Rosalind, would you allow me to uh, contribute to the other first, uh, second question? Because um, I think I can add uh, something on top of uh, what Anemi and, and Marco said. So with regards to the first question, to say that um, we are also considering indeed uh, small uh, towns. And for instance, we've been supporting through these co-creation and citizen engagement calls, cities like Mataro, which is a very really small one near Barcelona, uh, Pula, or for instance, uh, Lubos is also a small city in Romania. Um, and for the, for the energy question, uh, in, in, in fact, this, this project in Mataro that I just mentioned last year was dealing with energy communities. So what they did is to uh, promote uh, the idea and the creation and information around how to manage an, an energy community uh, within a very um, specific a neighborhood where normally immigrants live there. So we are talking about less favored uh, communities. And it was a very successful um, um, project just because these, these people uh, live at the edge of, of poverty in certain uh, moments, and especially in terms of energy uh, poverty. So um, the energy communities uh, project, I think it was a very successful one that we would like to to replicate in other places, especially in the in the current context. So about the lessons learned, I'm sorry for bringing these these other uh, two points. Uh, about the lessons learned, well, I think that the, the main lesson learned is that we need to put citizens at the core. So what we need to be aware that what we're doing is social innovation. So we really need to ask and understand what are the demands of the citizens. And not only that, we need to then uh, work together with them to co-create and co-design the solutions that they really need and they really want. There's no point in anyone deciding on behalf of others uh, what um, product service needs to be introduced in the market or what 
uh, big skyscraper needs to be built in whatever neighborhood. Um, the point is to understand what's the social demand of weather and use innovation um, to deliver the European Bauhaus. Uh, another key learning is that we really need a multi-level approach. Um, we need to work uh, with all levels of governments and we need to work also at grassroots level and connect uh, those that um, traditionally have not always been uh, going along together. And, and the other uh, learning I would say is that we need to uh, bring in as main character the cultural and creative industries that for some reason have been uh, neglected over the time and do have a key role to play in the delivery of the new European Bauhaus. So I would say those are our, our main um, learnings. And of course, whatever we do with this EIT community in European Bauhaus has to do with transparency because the new European Bauhaus is about transparency. It is about cross-pollination. It is about uh, disseminating efforts so that whatever successful uh, results we have can be scaled up and can have um, um, more expansion in terms of reach. Excellent. These are already extremely uh, important lessons you have learned. So thank you so much for sharing them. Um, let's go because there's also again a question on craft. So let's go back to you, Anami. And the question uh, is what role sees craft for the culture and creative sectors to support the local transformation of cities? Yes, well, the most obvious answer here is, of course, that uh, we are going to organize uh, a big storytelling campaign. So we are with these cities, with all the students, with all the citizens, we are collecting positive stories. So how people are making a change in their local communities. We're collecting them and then we want to show them to others for inspiration in different kinds of formats, very visual and interactive. So that's a first obvious role. But in addition, of course, um, we know that arts and culture have a big role in challenging business as usual, um, asking different questions, maybe looking for different ways of doing things, getting people to think differently and, and to interact with each other in a way that they haven't done before, bringing different kinds of disciplines and, and citizens and communities together. To, to look for, for, not just look for solutions immediately, not instrumental, but take a step back and think, where do we actually want to go? What, what would it look like if we're successful? You know, imagine, not doomsday, not catastrophes, but imagine that we succeed. What, what is 2030 going to look like? And how do we get there? And what can you do? What can each person do to contribute to this? So that is going to be a very important role for arts and culture across Europe, but also very locally. We even work with, um, like, for example, a, a small local theater that builds stories together with its audience. Can they become a coach for cities across Europe to learn how to interact better with their citizens, you know, or in a different way? Those kinds of things we're going to do. Excellent. Uh, then there was also, and this is the last question, unfortunately, that I can take uh, from the from the Slido questions. Uh, and uh, this was a question, uh, I think it's for you, uh, Marcos. How can we motivate member states to use the recovery and resilience facility also for new European Bauhaus purposes? Well, I think uh, we have to spread the principles of the new European Bauhaus. We, we have to mobilize all the possibilities that the European Commission, the European Parliament, the European Council has, have, and we have to motivate them by, by ex ex uh, explaining that um, the new European Bauhaus is not an imposition, it's, it, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, we, we need to to think different, we need to invest a lot of money. We are going to invest a lot of money with the recovery and resilience funds and the, with the uh, European funds uh, and the European budget. But we can invest the same money, but uh, thinking about how to do that, not only thinking on uh, sustainability, but also how to improve the, the quality of life that, of people who live in the buildings that we are to uh, that we are going to uh, refurbish, and I think this is the, the best way to in involve the member states. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we are coming to the end of this session. Um, and uh, I will basically, before I close, ask actually our panelists the same question as we asked also our audience at the beginning. So very quickly, what is New European Bauhaus to you in one word? So let's start maybe with Alicia, one word. Okay, I was hoping for two. <laughs> okay. So, uh, for me, it's inspiration and it's a positive outlook to the future. More than two, sorry. <laughs> Natalia. If it's just one word, opportunity. Perfect. Anemi. Building our futures, one word. Marcos. For me, it's paradigm shift. Paradigm shift, perfect. Thank you so much. I mean, at least I'm no longer confused. I'm actually extremely enthusiastic about this new European Bauhaus movement that we can together have a role in making our society sustainable, inclusive and beautiful. So please go to the website of the EIT community, of the Craft Project, of the European Commission and get involved. Thank you very much.